Hello, my name is Muhammad Kassim. I'm a clinical anatomy research fellow here at the Seattle Science Foundation. And today, I'm very excited to actually be talking about a paper, a review I was writing about intramedullary replacement of ventricular shunts and using bone as a distal absorption site. So hopefully this will be a big uh, kind of an anatomy review lesson as well as some new, uh, new concepts to everyone. Okay, so the outline, um, we're gonna go over the introduction, just uh, CSF for the physiology, treatment of hydrocephalus, uh, shunts and the different types. And then we'll look at a little bit, a little bit of bone physiology um, and some alternate bone absorption sites and then we'll, we'll end with complications and conclusions and we'll do questions at the end. So cerebral ventricular shunts. So uh, these, are, these are shunts that are devices that are meant to divert CSF through a series of uh, catheters and valves uh, when the normal pathway for uh, CSF is insufficient. So it's a shunting, shunting system essentially to, to divert CSF into a cavity for elimination. So what are the indications for shunt? So there's, uh, first we'll go over the perinatal period. So um, during the perinatal period, there, patients can either have uh, infantile hydrocephalus, uh, secondary to meningomyelocele, or meningocele, they can have obstruction or communicating hydrocephalus, um, or they can have intraventricular hemorrhage, congenital cysts, or tumors, anything that could cause uh, blockage of the, of the CSF, the normal pathway of it. Uh, in adults, the, the list isn't as long, um, but you can have subarachnoid hemorrhage, uh, or blood, uh, edema, and um, just cellular debris will cause obstruction of the of the normal CSF flow. And then in patients with elevated intracranial pressure uh, could, from trauma or any other number of reasons, um, it could block CSF drainage. So the indication for a shunt would be appropriate there. So CSF production, it's produced, about 80% of it is made in the choroid plexuses and the ventricles. The remainder of the 20% is kind of distributed in other places, but we'll focus on the choroid plexuses for now. Um, de novo synthesis of it is about 0.37 uh, milliliters per minute and it's turnover about four times a day um, so it's got a high turnover rate and we'll go over why here in a second but so a little bit of review of the, of the circulation of it so it goes from lateral ventricles or the ventricles permian magendi permian luska uh, perimedullary uh, and the subarachnoid spaces in the basal cistern and then back to the superior and lateral surfaces of the cerebral hemispheres and then eventually it'll be drained through the uh, arachnoid villi arachnoid uh, granulation so, uh, like any um, system with, with uh, fluid, you, if you want to drive it, you need a gradient, right? So, the highest, uh, highest pressures are going to be in the ventricles, and the lowest pressure will be distal as you go away from the, from the ventricles down the subarachnoid space. Um, so, that's a natural gradient for the cere cerebral spinal fluid to move. Um, but then you've also got arterial, arterial pulsations within the choroid plexuses, which will help drive um, additional driving force. And that's actually what you're seeing here in this is the uh, CSF moving through the system. So what does the CSF do? This is all gonna bring back memories from medical school, right? So CSF, is, it has a couple roles, right? So it's, it can act as a, as a water jacket, essentially, for the brain and spinal cord to cushion it from, um, it's like a shock absorber, right? From um, sudden acceleration to decelerations, it'll help absorb some of the shock there. Um, it also has, it acts like a, um, works as a buoyant force, right? So the brain itself, the dry weight is about 1,300 grams. Uh, when it's suspended in the CSF fluid, it's about 45 grams. So it helps kind of um, let it flow and it doesn't um, it re removes some of the pressure essentially on the, on the bottom of the, the brain so it doesn't compress uh, the nerves. Some of the other things that it does is it helps flush um, some of the waste products of the CNS. Um, like we said earlier, it, it, the, the system can be regenerated about four times a day. The complete volume of CSF is regenerated about four times a day. So this is, that's, that's one of the reasons, it's because it's flushing all those, the toxins out and the, and the, um, the toxic metabolites out. So the other thing it does is it helps um, maintain an electrolyte balance for, for the neurons as well. So we wanna treat hydrocephalus and um, we wanna relieve elevated intracranial pressure by shunting. So the shunt is, like we said earlier, it goes, um, it re-diverts essentially the, the fluid away from uh, the blocked area out to a distal site to, to absorb it. And there's three different shunting systems that are, that are commonly used. It's the ventricular, ventricular atrial, the VA shunt, ventricular pleural, and the ventricular uh, perineal shunts. There are other sites, I'm um, not gonna really go into detail on them, but there, you could, the fallopian tubes have been used as a receptacle site, gallbladder, thoracic duct, and the parotid duct. So before I go into details on the shunts themselves, um, let's just go over kind of a, a general idea of what, what a shunt consists of. So you've got the proximal limb, which is the, the inflow catheter, and then you've got the, a valve mechanism, which will monitor uh, differential pressures, outflow, the amount of outflow, and um, how much can move through the system, and then you've got an outflow uh, catheter or the distal limb, which will be um, in, uh, 
the site that we choose essentially the receptacle site. Okay, so the ventricular peritoneal shunt, this is the most common shunt that's used. Um, the proximal limb will be in the ventricle, the lateral ventricle usually, and the distal limb will be in the peritoneal cavity, the abdominal area. Um, the reason the peritoneal cavity is used uh, is chosen because it has a large um, capability of absorbing fluids. So it's, it's, it's really good at that. Um, the only downsides to using this kind of a shunt is that you can have uh, inguinal hernias, you can get obstructions. Um, as the uh, child gets older, um, you'll need to lengthen the, the distal uh, end. And then you can get peritonitis with, with, with this. This is a, is a foreign body. Um, there are contraindications to using this system. Um, so if there's any uh, patient needs abdominal surgery, if there's abdominal infection, appendicitis, peritonitis, um, diverticulitis, uh, patient is on um, antibiotic treatment for something going on uh, pathology in the abdomen. This is something we do not want to do not want to use. The next one is the ventricular pleural shunt. This is just an alternative to uh, the VP shunt, and this is going from the ventricle to the pleural cavity, so the area around the lungs. Um, this site also is capable of absorbing uh, uh, large volumes of fluids. So complications with this, you can get pleural effusions, pneumothoraces, um, and then the shunt itself can erode through the um, through chest wall causing subcutaneous edema and obviously failure of the shunt. Um, the next common one is the ventricular atrial shunt. So this one is the treatment of choice if you can't use the, the, the VP or VPL shunts. Um, this will go through, it'll tunnel through the jugular vein to the superior vena cava and the distal tip will be in the right atrium. The downside to this, like the other ones, um, this one requires more revisions. Uh, so more surgeries or more adjustments. Um, so as the child grows, it need, that distal tip needs to be in the, in the right atrium. Um, infection is more serious with this one um, because this one you can get endocarditis with. Uh, pulmonary embolisms can occur with this one um, because the shunt is in the bloodstream. Um, it could lead to sepsis. So complications with shunts in general, within the first year, about 40% 40, 40 of them will fail. Uh, the most common signs of failure, failure are that hydrocephalic presentation. I'm sure everyone remembers from, from med school. I'll go people will review of it. So in infants, it's going to be different. They're not going to be able to communicate with you, but they're going to, they're also going to show they'll have poor feeding, irritability, um, reduced activity, uh, they'll be vomiting. In adults and in children who can communicate, uh, they'll have slowing of their mental capacity, um, they'll have uh, neck pain, they'll have headaches uh, more so than, than in, um, in infants because the skull is, is more rigid, it doesn't have the capability of stretching. Um, neck pain because tons you could have tonsillar herniation, nausea, vomiting, um, double vision, um, and then even paraventricular uh, tract um, uh, compression causing uh, gait abnormalities and spasticity. Um, so there's a couple things that could cause shunt failure. Um, most common ones are obstruction. Um, it could get disconnected. It could get infected. It could erode, erode the skin wall. Um, Seizures can cause it to dislodge, the distal portion to dislodge, or even the proximal portion to dislodge. Um, you can develop allergies or um, cancers can cause blockages of the actual shunt. So what if all of these sites are um, unavailable to use, or there's complications and for some reason we, can, we can't use them? Then maybe we should look at bone, right? So bone's been used for intraosseous infusion since World War II. Um, just like everyone's seen in the ED, you've got the IO um, devices. Um, that's, that's what we're referring to here. So in 2008, there was, uh, there was a study that showed that there's no statistical difference in the pharmacokinetic uh, uh, parameters using IO versus IV access, and they were testing uh, morphine. A couple other studies, one used uh, epinephrine, and they showed that there was the bioavailability was the same in uh, IO versus IV. That's really interesting. There's a quick bone physiology. So the reason, uh, the reasons of the bone, if you guys remember, are broken up into epiphysis, metaphysis, and diaphysis, and the area that we are concerned with is going to be the epiphysis. Um, and that's the, um, that's the area where you've got the, the, the vascular network, the, the, the rich um, networks of the Havergen uh, system. That's the cancellous region. Um, and this is typically found in, in um, using the long bones, like tibia and humerus. But um, the cancellous region is by design meant to have quick and rapid access to the vascular system, right? If you make more blood cells there, you want to get those red blood cells into their, their peripheral system. So, um, as I alluded to earlier, the, the Haversion system, you've got the Haversion canals and Volkman's canals. And let's see if my little laser here shows up. It doesn't. Okay. So the. That's okay. Okay. So 
the haversian canals are in the vertical direction. These are running parallel to the osteons, and these will be connected with the haversian, uh, or the, I'm sorry, the Volkmann's canals, and those are running in a horizontal, in a horizontal direction. These interconnect the, the haversian canals, and these, this entire system has the blood vessels, the lymph, and the, the nerves are running through them, and they're all communicating with each other. So IO needles and catheters are, are used to penetrate the cortex of these long bones, the epiphyses of long bones, in order to access this, this system, essentially. And um, that gives us the use of permitting, you can put medications, um, fluids, etc., through it. So earliest shunts were in the 20th century by Harvey Cushing. He's the founder of modern neurosurgery, essentially um, uh, the founder of neurosurgery. And he shows us that, uh, that there was a way he could um, treat hydrocephalus in the very, very early days. So in 1902 and 1913, he showed uh, described a surgery called a cisterno uh, retroperitoneal shunt on two children with mild meningocele and hydrocephalus. He used a metal trocar uh, to form communication between the cistern and the uh, adjacent lumbar L5 body um, to treat the patient. Um, and then in, in 1950, uh, the NOSIC detailed a procedure where he uh, shunted CSF from the ventricles and to the mastoid bone. He performed uh, a ventricular mastoid ostomy there. And in 52, um, uh, Svan et al. had basically advanced that procedure, and they had um, removed a portion of the mastoid cells in order to accommodate for that distal tubing to go to go in there and, and um, use it as a receptacle. And then in '59, the procedure was modified once again, and they added a um, they called it a tantalum button. Essentially, it's a it's a device that would hold that distal tubing in place so that it would prevent dislodging it. Um, there were complications with with that. With this procedure, um, pneumonitis and meningitis were, were were pretty common with it. So, using bones as a distal absorption site. So, the three different bones that we want to talk about are the manubrium, the ilium, and the diploic space of the cranium. So, first we'll start. We'll start with the manubrium. So, this has been used in the past for volume resuscitation. It's capable of accepting uh, pretty large volumes of water over a short period of time. Uh, one study showed that it showed it was able to accept 80 mils uh, per minute by gravity drip and then up to 150 milliliters per minute uh, via syringe bolus. And then uh, Tubbs et al. Had, had demonstrated the ability for it to take 30 liters of water over 60 minutes. Um, uh, and they tested it on uh, fresh human cadavers, monkeys, and, and swine. The ilium is another, uh, another receptacle site that could be used. Um, Dr. Tubbs and his group also demonstrated the ability on this one. They used 30 liters of fluid um, over a 60 minute period and it was easily able to handle that without any leaks. Um, interestingly with this one, there was um, a letter to the editor by uh, Goldstein et al. that actually um, attempted the venture iliac shunt that um, Tubbs and the colleagues had tried. Um, unfortunately, it didn't, it didn't succeed, but uh, not because of the protocol that was presented in, in the initial paper, but because they think that the, the distal portion of the catheter um, had gotten loose, they didn't put enough bone wax in it, essentially. So it wasn't the protocol itself, I think that was the, the problem. The diploic space is uh, really, really interesting. Um, this, the diploic venous system was first discovered in the 19th century um, by an adapted surgeon, Guillaume Dupatrian. So it's a venous network between the two compact layers of bone um, in the skull, and it's, it's filled with cancel's bone, and then that cancel's bone, actually, we give it a name in this area, it's called the diploa. So these veins will communicate with the dural sinuses, uh, eventually the, the superior sagittal sinus, and as well as the, uh, the peripheral uh, vasculature. So it's a possible site we could use um, for, uh, as a receptacle for CSF. So in 2007, Pew et al. tested the ability of the diploic space um, uh, to receive small amounts of tracer fluids. Uh, they tested it on um, sedated uh, adult pigs. And the tracer fluids they used were iso uh, isothiocyanate, uh, dextran, and then 50% dextrose. And they had two groups. So the control group was the group that um, they had infusions directly into the ear vein, so directly into the vascular system. And then the experimental group, they were uh, infusing these tracer fluids directly into the skull. They wanted to see how fast um, the uh, glucose response was, essentially, to, uh, to the um, what they had infused into them. So they injected initially 20 mils of the 50% dextrose into the experimental group, and that took about 43 seconds. With the control group, they, it, took, it was faster. It took uh, 26 seconds, but um, they found that at the 45 second mark, they both had the uh, uh, same amount of glucose serum levels. So it was absorbed quickly um, in, in both groups. 
even though at different times, but the, the glucose response was the same. Um, so they took it a step further because they had to use a large volume with the glucose. They used another um, molecule called, uh, it's the FITC dextran. It's a 70 kilodalton molecule, just a much larger uh, molecule. They were able to use a smaller volume. And this molecule, because it's so big, once they infused it into the intravascular space, it, it, didn't, it doesn't escape because it's so big. So they were able to pick it up on the fluoroscope much, much easier. So they used two mils. Um, and in this, this time when they did this, they found that it took about the same time uh, before they were able to detect it in the blood. So that showed that it was able to, it was being absorbed very, very quickly. Um, so the complications of, of using bone as, uh, as a receptacle for, for CSF. So uh, bone marrow and fat embolisms are all are possibilities of it. But Ar Arlowski et al. had found that there may be no correlation at all. Uh, they found that there was no hemodynamic changes in, in, um, in their uh, test cases. And um, the diploic space is not necessarily a, uh, a yellow fat-rich marrow site. Uh, so it's not really as much of a concern. The complications associated with, with intraosseous access in general are about less than 1%, so it's pretty safe. Um, there was one large study that showed that osteomyelitis, uh, they had a rate of about a 0.6% rate of osteomyelitis, but um, there were many smaller cases that didn't have any cases of osteomyelitis infection. So for conclusions, intraosseous placement um, into the, for ventricular division shunts could be alternatives to what we normally traditionally use, like the, the VPL, the V, um, the VP and the VA shunts, excuse me. But um, so when these traditional sites are unavailable or contraindicated, uh, why not use the medullary space uh, and bone as another option? So the next step would be cadaveric feasibility studies um, on the calvarial diploa as a receptacle for, C for CSF. Excuse me. Any questions? Any questions? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Very good. <laughs>